Hi, I'm Karen Schussler, and today I'm going to give you a few of my tips for keeping the choir singing in tune on an a cappella piece. So often when I go to the internet or different books about ideas about how to keep a choir singing in tune, the suggestions they make, although they are probably valid, are not really all that practical. One I, that comes to mind is uh, if the room is too warm, your choir may sing flat. Well, I'm not going to do much about that. And if the choir, if the room is too cold, the choir might sing flat or whatever. But these uh, things that I do uh, preclude uh, any temperature control necessity. So, you know, maybe they can help in, um, in your situation. So the first thing that I often will do is when we do our warm-ups, we do onset, which is the getting... Um, getting the vocal folds phonating um, when they are just starting off with the air. And um, so it'd be like, Ooh, ee, ee, ah, oh. and you take a breath in between each one in order to practice that initial phonation uh, vibration of the vocal folds. So what we do with that for tuning uh, exercise is we'll do it in a chord, close, <laughs> maybe down a couple few cents, um, so bass, tenor, alto, soprano, and we'll do that, in a chord, but they do it a cappella. So they might need some help to start that. So I would do like, everyone start. And I'd play it after. And then, sorry. Just so that they can really adjust quickly. And after about two or three where I'm playing with, they're pretty much on their own. And that's one good way of uh, getting the choir to kind of sing in tune and really be listening. That's the key, is that they're really listening for both themselves and their relationship uh, to the other singers uh, as part of the chord, as part of the intervals. Another thing that we do as part of our regular warm-up is that we very often, well, we always do a segment in our warm-up about ear. And uh, because people come in off the street, they've been listening to chatter all day, half the time they're busy tuning out sounds because the busyness of our world and the noisiness of our world. And so they get into the, um, a musical situation and they've got to switch ears to a musical ear or a singing ear. And it's a different kind of listening than it is when you're out on the street. So we always do ear exercises in order to make that shift before they start doing uh, the repertoire. And one of the ear exercises I choose, maybe two or three uh, from my little packet <laughs> of a bunch, and, uh, and one that we do very often is chromatic scales. And the first time we started doing chromatic scales a number of years ago, uh, it was a disaster. I mean, they could, they could barely sing three notes chromatically or four or five. Uh, and now they just go up and down the scale like nothing. Um, so they'll do it on do or another uh, vowel, but usually with a D, because that gives a precision, with, and that consonant does not unseat the breath. It's not as explosive as some other ones. So they can focus more on uh, just making sure that their semitones are even. And so it'd be like this. I'd give them um, do and then high do. Right now that's C. And then we would do uh, maybe uh, in duplets. In triplets. and triplets, no problem, again, a cappella, so that they, they do it all without me playing, 
and, uh, and then when they get into the quadruplets, we haven't done that one that much, and so they kind of sometimes go off the rails, depending on how fast the tempo is. So maybe we'll nail that one down this year. That will be a, a challenge and a goal. And we follow that immediately with whole tones. So then we, go, we just go straight down. I'll just say whole tone. And you can divide that into two. I had singers say, we'll never get it. We'll never get it. I said, yes, you will. And we would just do, we'd do, do up to the tritone. That's the tricky one. First three notes are easy, obviously. It's a scale. But the next, well, now you've parted company. And so that's a little bit of a different story. So once they get used to that, then they're a little bit better. But then they also realize, and I can remind my altos, because that's usually the range where they start hitting the top of their... Um, their ceiling for their register, and I'll say now up and over, up and over, up and over, so that they're coming in to the top of the note rather than keep pushing up from underneath, and then they stay in tune much, much better, and then they hopefully remember it into the rehearsal. That's the goal. Uh, another one that we do, which again was challenging at first, but not so much anymore, is up a tone, down a semi, up a tone, down a semi. It's very similar. You oh, can start anywhere and end anywhere. So. at some point, but that's another uh, good one for them to just realize that when you go up a whole tone, it's a big step. And a lot of times they'll, um, in, a, in a chord or a scale, for instance, a line uh, within a piece, you know, I'll say, I don't think that was a whole tone, I think it was a three quarter tone. So let's just try that again. Uh, so that's a good one to do for that. Then uh, the, L, uh, the interval exercise, which they love dearly, ha ha ha, and that is start somewhere in the middle, like I'm starting on F right now, and you just, they all sing this, uh, uh, no, sorry, minor second, minor second, major second, major second, minor third, minor third, rehearsal just to get them to come back next fall that we're going to take it all the way up the octave this year because they can pretty much get through the fifths without any problem again no playing so what they will do is they if if um, if I'm teaching them like I will next fall more of the bigger intervals it'll be like um, I'll just do perfect fifth perfect fifth perfect fifth <laughs> see I don't know I miss it. Okay, choir, let's do that one again. <laughs> perfect fifth, perfect fifth. In my basement down there. Uh, but you get the idea of just checking right away after they've sung. And then they adjust, and then you just, you just kind of um, confer, secure it by, by a few repetitions. Uh, diatonic scales with an anchor, because a scale as you know, is uh, really a relationship between the note that you're singing or playing and another note. And it's usually the note that's Do. And so, I'll go a little higher here. So if I'm doing, and so an anchor would be, in this case, it's gonna be D. And I'm gonna do, because I have a piano, so it's not gonna hold the anchor very long. So you do it, I do a tremolo down there. Is it an exact fa? Is it an exact so? I'm doing that as a singer. Not so much me, listen, I'm listening to them as a choir director, of course, but their job is to listen to themselves and make sure that their relationship 
is true. And that's the, the exercise on that one. And, I, and again, I, I'll, do, I'll do this. But I'll never play it with them because that, I mean, then they're not learning anything, you know, if you do that. So, um, except to listen to the piano. <laughs> that's really not the goal here. Uh, not if you're doing a cappella, it's not. Um, okay, so then the next one is, uh, this is a little trickier, if you're remembering your modes from theory class. Um, the modes all have, are there scales, like for instance, between C to C, with no, blacks, uh, no black keys, is uh, the Ionian mode, which is our major scale. So it has a semitone between three and four and seven and eight. Now, if I move my hand up to D, I will have uh, the Dorian mode, uh, but I don't put any, any sharps in, and I just run the white keys again. So the semitones and the whole tones have now shifted between two different notes. And, uh, and so if we're singing a piece in Dorian mode, the choir needs to have that in their ear in order to negotiate what they see on the page. A third may be a major third, or it might be a minor third, or second, a, a, a minor second, major second, according to, because not everybody's going to read the scale, right, on the, on the staff, because um, not everyone has that kind of um, theoretical background. So uh, what we do um, with those is that there's a little intonation that I learned from James Jordan from um, Westminster Choir College when I did a course there and and he had again you use the anchor and you start on the fifth and basically you do um, five six five four three two seven one is what you do and then you've got all the notes of the scale in your throat or in your voice I should say and um, and, and in your ear now he changes for this technique. He changes some of the vowels on the um, uh, on the syllables to be a little more pointed. They have a little bit of a narrower tuning focus. So, for instance, instead of so, it's su, which it has more precision for tuning. Instead of re, it's re. That kind of thing. So, for major, it would be su la su. Fa, mi, ri, ti, du. And they'd learn that. It's not, it's not hard. Um, so if, for instance, if I'm doing major. because in, um, in our solfege, uh, the fifth of the scale is not so, the fifth of, of the scale is mi. So in that case, it's going to be mi, fa, you see, so it's not like su, la, which is major, second, it's um, mi, fa, which is minor, second, so already off the get-go, you're in another land, right, another realm. So it goes mi, fa, mi, ri, du, Ti, su, su, uh, lowered, lowered seventh, fa, or, that's for um, aeolian mode, or, uh, ti, si, la. And I just have them do ti, su. I mean, after a while, fussing around with all, this is enough theory for them. <laughs> they they want to sing their music. Let me get to the songs. <laughs> Stop this. You know, so, yeah, I know, I only, I only press them so far with uh, the Sus and the Cs and all that stuff. But anyway, they, they can, and they write it in, you know, like M, F, M, R uh, at the top of their page. And then when we do the intonation, they can read it off, which isn't the problem. Dorian is going to be similar, but it's um, instead of Su and instead of Mi, you're going to start with La. So, for instance, uh, La and then T. Another land. 
And then mixolydian is very close, as you know, to major. They just have to have a lowered seventh. Uh, I don't often do that one uh, again, um, but or not often. I, I'll do it at the beginning when we learn the piece, but not some of these. I'll do every single rehearsal because it's just such a different world. Okay, so mixolydian. You're starting with re, so it's um, me, <coughs> me, re, wrong, 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 wrong. Re me. Sorry. Re me. Re. your mixolydian okay you can do that a couple of times and then they'll go oh wow that really is different what do you know and stuff and a lot of people believe it or not get off on that because you've let them into an inner secret of music and they love music that's why they're there and so ooh, we've unlocked the door of secrets oh, this is exciting they'll say i love that <laughs> because lots of people probably don't, uh, but we do it anyway. Okay, so the next thing after the ear, ear tests, uh, we match vowels. Matching vowels uh, is, is tricky, uh, but it comes from partly the understanding that uh, our spoken language is not the vowel sounds that we want to use for singing. And they've done studies, <clears throat> you know, like mother tongue lives in one part of the brain, lights it up, and, an, and a second learned language uh, lights up a different part of the brain. And sung mother tongue, i.e. for us, for me, English, uh, lights up the foreign language part of the brain. And so once I tell the singers that, uh, that the brain does not recognize sung English as mother tongue, that takes away a lot of the resistance to changing some of the pronunciations of the words because some of them just, it's hard work because they just want to sing it like they say it, but then it's not going to match anybody else as far as vowel sounds are concerned. So once I explain that, it really does take away a certain amount of, of that resistance and, and we're you know, moving along a lot faster. Uh, so uh, then once a year, I'll do a little exercise with one person, this lucky person, in the choir, in each choir I do, and this is kids too, because they, they have good ears, just like everybody else, and I'll have this person sing with, usually it's a, obviously it's a, it's a female, because I want to be able to match them perfectly, and uh, so we'll sing, I'll have her sing uh, do on a note like do, and keep taking breaths and keep coming in, and meanwhile I'll sing with her, and I'll do this, do, And they're just like, wow. And I was like, could you hear it go out of tune? Yeah. Was I singing the wrong note? No. You know, it was like, it's like, but I do it every year because they have to be reminded that this is, this is a real thing because a lot of them won't want to make the vowel shapes because that's work, okay? They're already working in <clears throat> their mind for tuning. They're working for reading the music. They're working for counting. They're working for, you know, cutoffs and onsets and breathing and everything else. And, you know, like, like forget this part. And so I have to make it um, show how important it is for the tuning. Okay, so I do that. And then, um, then also then to make the right shape. So an O is an O. Ha, huh? big, big surprise there. But it's not this. Oh. You hear the difference. So I'll do that. They all hear it. And ooh, I'll say, pucker up, everybody. Okay, or, or like you're, you're drinking a, a McDonald's milkshake through a big straw, that kind of idea. Uh, and, and everything is north and south, nothing is east and west. And if you can make them sing so that this is like this, and your lips are like trumpet uh, bell, you're good to go. Because that's really the, um, uh, uh, the best, you get the best resonance for singing and the best matching for singing. And I've had, I've had singers tell me that when we, when, we, when we fuss about that, that they can hear a difference in the tuning down their row when we're all like this. Because all the vowels are more similar. Uh, Oz uh, definitely need attention to be, because it's big. 
And Oz, the biggest vowel we've got. It's just an open space inside, basically. And so there's lots of options. <laughs> and, and people in this part of the world, we tend to have a darker awe. Uh, so we'll say father. And set, you know, Michigan here, father. <laughs> you know, it's quite a big difference. And so we, we work on awe. Uh, it needs to be in the cheekbones so it doesn't get too dark. Father, father. And then, um, and otherwise, and I'll say, no, not in your jowls, father, and they can hear the difference and how flattening it sounds because there's no overtones, you see. That's what it does. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, also, we tune our consonants. Now, sometimes that, you know, that makes sense with M's and N's and, and Z's and V's, and they have pitch, so that's fine. Watch R's. They will throw tuning like faster than anything. So you have to be really careful about that. But we also tune uh, the L's and the TH's like we're the. And I'll have them all sing on that. So that they get a really good feel for, yeah, there's a pitch in there somewhere. And also we'll tune, quote, the consonants that don't have pitch, like D's and T's and K's, because if I say, got to tune your consonants, that means that they're listening for tuning before they start the vowel. And because once you get into it, you're going to hear the going up and going down as they go, oh, that's a little flat. I mean, they don't know that consciously. Their ear is telling them and they adjust, which is brilliant and I'm so glad. But it's better if they don't have to adjust. So they listen ahead of time to tune that P coming in or tune that uh, TR coming in or something like that. And uh, it makes a huge difference. Tune your consonants and it's like, whoa, it's a big difference for tuning. Um, then we have to be careful about physical uh, reasons for going out of tune. Uh, the two big ones, actually there's, actually there's everybody's got a big one. Uh, sopranos will, will run into, first of all, sopranos who are not in their 20s or younger. Um, when, they're in, when they're younger, they just kind of negotiate the registers kind of automatically. And it's just, it just kind of happens. And uh, as we age, the muscles, in order to access the next register up, just don't respond quite as readily. And so it's very easy for, oh, and then sopranos are used to, I sing high notes. I will be careful with high notes. Their high notes are great. The high notes are no problem. What's a problem is C to D <laughs> and D to E. Those notes are really awful. <laughs> so I have to have a really good ear for those because they'll sneak in there with a bow and it'll sound like this. You'll hear it. Uh, I just went like this and that's going to be flat sounding and if anybody is tuning to it which they will if they're a soprano because they all tune to the sopranos um, I made the adjustment to go up you see uh, they have to be told to do that because they'll just forget and um, uh, and altos have the same problem going from F to G especially your, especially your lower altos and, and G to A and I have to remind them every single time because they're not professional. And the difference between a professional chorister, I learned this from um, uh, Alice, Alice Walker. At, no, that's not it. Alice. She was with um, Robert Shaw. Who was that? Uh, okay. Anyway, she's like the grandmother of community singing and, um, uh, and, and wrote all the pieces that it says that Robert Shaw wrote. <laughs> she actually actually wrote them. Anyway, and she traveled with them and stuff, and she said that the, the difference between a professional uh, singer and an amateur singer is that the professional singers remember. And I mentioned that to the choir once, and they go, well, of course, they're paid to remember. So I mean, so, so unless you want to, you know, up the pay scale for your volunteer choir, you know, I, I think that we're just going to have to just keep reminding people. And once I heard that, I, I didn't get so frustrated. It was quite wonderful. I don't expect them to remember. I just tell them, it's done. Oh, oh yeah, I got it. Good. Let's go. Uh, so the thing with um, uh, that is that with the altos and the sopranos, you've got those two uh, passaggi, <clears throat> those two areas of transition. With the basses, the basses um, uh, 
first of all, with bassists, they love their own sound because it rumbles around in their chest and they just think it's heaven on earth. And so they'll sing back. They go, uh, well, that'll come out flat, you see, instead of, uh, which has the brighter sound. So you have to be careful about that because basses will sound flat without too much suggestion. Uh, the other thing about men in, partic uh, in general is that when they get to middle C uh, concert pitch above the bass staff, um, they need double the support. I just tell them anything, C and above, double the support. And that's for tenors, baritones, basses, doesn't matter. And I know that, you know, that's kind of a, a quick and dirty, but it really does help because otherwise they'll be kind of going up into that higher territory and they'll be sounding pretty flat unless they kick in on middle C. And, uh, and so that's another thing to keep in mind. Also, guys, as you know, can flip into falsetto. Some of them resist. Um, so we work on falsetto. And um, my boys and my teens in the youth choir, they all still sing in falsetto. In fact, my boys in the youth choir, they sing the desk hands because <laughs> they want to keep their, their higher notes, you know. Um, but uh, I, I um, work on the falsetto with the guys and order, in order for them to be able to access it more easily. Some of them end up still having problems, but, um, but you, have to just, you have to just threaten the women with torture and near death so that they do not laugh. Because if they laugh, they're out. You know, I just meant, no way, Jose. You should be so lucky as to access another octave to your range. Well, let's see you do that, you see. So, so um, it's a different sort of thing uh, to, and so that the guys can, can go up there. If they can access what's called voce finta, which is a, a lighter sound up there, that's the best. And, um, uh, but sometimes in a rehearsal, I don't have time to do something like that. That would be more for a men's sectional or something where I'd work on that. But that's the, that's the best way to go. Um, okay, because you, you get good tuning. Because if they carry their bottom voice up, that's what you'll hear. It'll, it'll sound like, you know, the Met stage, you know, with the tenor, oh, you sort of thing. Because, and, and that's not good for um, uh, tuning chords for, for choirs. Uh, okay, so then if all else fails, those are pretty much all the things that I do in order to keep um, the, um, the, note, the uh, acapella pieces in tune. But if all else fails and we end up singing flat or sharp, never happens sharp, <laughs> it was always flat, um, and I couldn't hear where it went, and I'll ask the choir, did anyone hear where it went? Because some people in the choir will be able to tell, and, and they don't hear where it's flat or where it went, then I'll record it, and then I'll go back in the week, and I'll listen to it with the keyboard, I'll find out where it was, and as soon as I find out where it is, I'll hear immediately what the problem was, like which one of these items it was. <clears throat> I will send out a loving email <laughs> of the, this is what the alto should be doing at this bar, da 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 da, to fix it, and so then we won't be going out of tune. And they will. They'll read the email and they'll fix it and we'll come back and we won't have another problem. And it's really quite magical and I'm grateful. <laughs> anyway, I hope you found something that works for you and good luck with your acapella pieces uh, next season. Bye for now.